today who will be celebrating communion. So those uh, here in person, if you will make sure you have your little package communion all together, we'll open that up later today. If you don't have that, just grab that from somebody in the back. At home, you're welcome to go ahead and get some bread and juice and have that ready for the service later on. Also, I want you to notice that we're sending something different for the response to forgiveness. A stanza from Little Town of Bethlehem, so Tony will get us started on that instead of the glory offering. We are still needing people to collect or to, uh, to sign up for an angel for community child care. If you would like to buy some gifts for somebody, uh, you'll see Eva. Eva, if you'll wave your hand once again and see her after worship. We have about, what, 10 or so? 15? 15 kids. And we still need to go ahead and get someone to sponsor and do a little shopping for them. We have a youth event after church today. We're going to end that just a little early because of the parade. So it'll start at 11 and it'll go to 12.15. And then information about the youth event next Saturday here at church for a little Christmas gathering is in the bulletin. And we're also hoping to do Christmas caroling to homebound people on December 19th, right after worship. Is that right? We're staying. And you here? Is that right? After worship we're doing that? Yes. Okay. Brenda, is that right? Okay, so if, uh, what we want to know is if you're available and willing to sing, will you raise your hands right now? And just if you're able to do that, nice and high, we to see. All right, I'm seeing, uh, all right, about six or seven or eight, something like that. Any uh -huh. choir members? All right, we need strong voices. That's where you go. Okay, good. Well, it looks like we're good then. That's wonderful. Also, the, the chair lift is now working, but we need to do some instructions. So if you are interested in using that on a Sunday morning or another time during the week, just contact the office. And we'll do a little training uh, event to show you how to use it, and so it's nice and safe. There is a call session meeting right after worship in the session room. It'll be short. We want to receive some new members and also approve the budget for next year. Any announcements from you all? Yes, the water class will not be again until after the new year. Okay, water color class is not be until after the new year. Let us worship God. Peace to his people in heaven. Peace is our confessing our 
good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, <coughs> confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Faithfulness 
that enables Jesus to be born, first of all, because if Joseph wasn't faithful, he wouldn't have listened to the angel who said, take Mary to be your wife. So his faithfulness kind of prepares the way. And I think that's important because sometimes faithfulness is quiet. Maybe that's the way it is most of the time, where you're just doing what you should be doing, you're faithful to God, and then God turns around and uses you in ways you never realize. Let's think about that. Let's pray together. Repeat after me. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For sending Jesus into our world. For sending Jesus into our world. And helping us to be faithful. And helping us to be faithful. In Jesus we pray. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Our next scripture is taken from Matthew 1, 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they had lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth, she will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall name, you shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke, awoke from the sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Whenever I visit my parents, they are ready for me. Mom will bake cookies, her preferably peanut butter or chocolate chip cookies. Fresh sheets are on the bed and towels in the bathroom. There will usually be a, a list of some sort, a to-do list. Things that need to be glued, questions that need to be asked that they keep forgetting when we're in a phone conversation. Just some things that need to be done around the house, changing the light bulb maybe. Things they should not be doing on a ladder at 90 years old. The most important part of them preparing for me is meatloaf. <laughs> It's a family tradition, actually a father-son tradition, not a family tradition, that dad has passed on to me. That when we have meatloaf, there might be some Bob Evans mashed potatoes and gravy and usually a salad, but I usually go light on that. So I have plenty of room for my favorite, peanut butter meatloaf sandwich. And I don't knock it if you haven't tried it, it's not fair. I will say at this point that I found out at the men's breakfast that this is not as unusual as you think. Lee Gary told me there are two restaurants outside of Cleveland, Ohio that have peanut burgers, which is peanut butter on hamburger. Same difference, right? Yeah, this has been passed on from my dad to me, and I'm thankful to say that my son now has embraced this wonderful meal. Nobody else in the family likes it. But what's interesting about this is my mother has no use for peanut butter uh, meatloaf sandwiches. In fact, mom doesn't even like meatloaf. But she cooks it for me. I can see their love in how they both prepare for my visit. Love is seen in the way you prepare for someone. Sometimes she goes overboard. This past Thanksgiving, she was planning on having two 24-pound turkeys for 11 people. 
Mom, I said, why so much turkey? Well, don't you want to have turkey sandwiches the next day? I was able to talk her down a few pounds. She got 15 of 12. So at the end of the Thanksgiving meal, we had a platter full of turkey from the first one. We never got into the second one. Last time I talked, they were still eating turkey. They might be eating turkey until Christmas. I don't know. We prepare in all kinds of ways. I read the story about Kathy Beach uh, Verde uh, and her mother's preparation for guests. Her mother prepares the house, cleans everything when someone's coming, and then she gets on her hands and knees and she combs the fringe on the oriental rugs in the living room. So all the fringe is just perfectly straight. She complains and say, Mother, don't you realize when the first person walks across the rug, it's going to get messed up. It doesn't matter. She's prepared for her guests. We are in the middle of preparing for Christmas. Christmas decorations, baking probably, shopping, lots of things to do on our list. Every Advent, John the Baptist shows up and reminds us to prepare our spiritual lives. Along with all the things we're doing on the outside, don't forget to prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare your own heart, your own life, to once again celebrate the birth of Christ. It's a spiritual preparation. And John's to-do list is having to do with repentance. Out in the wilderness, he says, prepare the way of the Lord. The way you do that is you confess your sins. His list is a little different than our decorating and buying gifts. It has to do with looking into the mirror closely. Trying to see your life, yourself, from God's perspective. You don't compare yourself to anybody else because there's always someone worse than you. You compare yourself to Christ. And when we do that, we find things that we need to confess. We're not loving people like we should. We judge people without knowing the whole story. We're impatient with people who have a different opinion than us. And repentance is reordering your life. It's turning in a new direction. It's not only confessing, but it's trying to change your ways to do better. To redirect your life. It often, often involves an attitude adjustment. Just like the hymn says, we are to uh, prepare him room. Joy to the world. We are to prepare him room. Room in our hearts. John's suggestion is we do that by confessing and repenting. When we celebrate communion, I don't think any of us celebrates communion thinking to ourselves, you know, I've really, I've done everything right this week. I'm pretty close to being perfect. The table itself reminds us that we are imperfect and we need God's grace constantly. And so John's message is the way you prepare is to repent. Joseph also has a way of preparing the way of the Lord. In our story this morning, you probably noticed that he says nothing. He basically makes a decision based on what happened to Mary. Then he is visited by an angel. And then he makes almost the opposite decision. But no words, no conversation. In many Christmas cards, you'll see Mary and the baby pushed to the front of the scene. You'll have the shepherds with a message, something like, you know, go tell others. You'll have the magi with a message like, you know, wise people still see him. What's the message with Joseph? What is Joseph saying to us? What's, what's his role in the story. Little Joey always wanted to be Joseph in the play. 
The problem was his older brother wanted to be Joseph as well. He tried to bargain with him and trade with him, but it didn't work. And when the older brother realized that Joey really wanted it, he made sure he didn't get it. Just like an older brother. And lo and behold, when all the parts were given out, Joey ends up being the innkeeper. How boring. And he was angry at his brother. So when the night of the play came along, Mary and Joseph and the baby, or Mary and Joseph come and they knock on the door, and Joey opens the door and Joseph says, my wife's pregnant and we're, we're traveling, do you have any room for us? The script read, I'm sorry there's no room, you can stay in the stable. But Joey, being rebellious, said, welcome! Come on in! There's plenty of room! His brother was shocked. He didn't know what to do. And then he got his wits. And he acted like he walked in the doorway and looked around and came back out to Mary and said, This place is filthy. Let's stay in the stable. <laughs> so, what is the role that Joseph plays here? Well, what can we learn from his, his life? The, the game plan was engagement for a year, and Joseph would go away, prepare a home for Mary and Joseph, and then he would come back at the end, roughly, of that year, and there would be a big party, and the, the marriage would be complete. Mary visits Elizabeth, comes back, and she's pregnant. And so Joseph has to make a decision. We know he's righteous, which means he is faithful to God, which means he's faithful to the law. He's faithful to do what the law says. The law says if she commits adultery, you divorce her. That's the law. That's what it means when it says he decided to divorce her. He decided to do it quietly with only a few witnesses and not publicly embarrass her. That was a nice thing. But he was righteous by divorcing her. Makes no sense to us. But the law said, you have to do this. You cannot forgive her and ignore like it happened. You must do that. And so he decides to do it because he's righteous. And then he has a dream. And the angel tells him there's something much bigger going on here than you'll ever understand. And this child will be Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. He will fulfill Old Testament prophecy. He is the Messiah, Emmanuel. God is coming to earth in this little one. So we're told Joseph gets up, and he marries her. He takes her at that point, and I guess he, he finishes the wherever they are in the process of that year, and then they're married. What's so interesting about his decision now is that faithfulness looks completely different than it did earlier. Because God is calling him to do something different. And now his faithfulness actually looks like a scandal. Him, he, he says he marries her. It's like Joseph now has broken the law. And did not finish this engagement time. He got it right. And so his faithfulness now leads into this idea that people will look at him and just shake their heads and say, I can't believe Joseph did that. Taking the blame on himself to protect Mary. That's faithfulness. Sometimes faithfulness doesn't look like what we expect. And sometimes faithfulness takes us into places that are really difficult. But God provides. Our way of preparing shows our love. We see just how much Joseph loves God by his faithfulness. And he prepares the way through his faithfulness for Jesus. Linda Wilson Allen is a 
public bus driver in San Francisco. <coughs> Article was written in her in, in the local paper, but uh, but she has created a community of blessings, is what it's called, with her regular bus people. She knows them all by name. She takes care of them. Very often you'll see her put the bus in park and help an elderly person up the stairs, help them with their groceries. There was one time where a young lady named Tanya was riding the bus regularly. She was by herself in San Francisco and, and she invited, Linda invited her to her Thanksgiving house, her house for Thanksgiving with her six children. And this is what she does, just loves people. And that's why this bus has become a bus of blessing. People will pass other buses up and wait for Linda's bus. Because they want a blessing. They want to interact with her. She has been blessed as well by these people. In the article, they asked, how do you prepare for your day? She said, I get up at 2.30 in the morning. She has an early job, of course. But 2.30 in the morning, and I begin with praying praying for the people I will interact this day and myself and how I can be a blessing to them. You can see how much she loves those people by the way she prepares for them. Our preparation during this Advent time shows our love for God. That's right. Gracious God, thank you for this time to prepare ourselves. Help us to be intentional about how we prepare and how we look forward to celebrating your birth once again. In Christ we pray. Amen. Our next hymn is 154.
litany, redeeming God, we are given many labels throughout our lives. Help us remember that the only one that matters is God. When we are unsure of our purpose, grant us the conviction of God matters. When we cower in the face of great responsibility or the rejection of others, grant us the tenacity of justice to trust not in our reputation but in your life. When we want to give in to disbelief and despair, grant us When we face long nights of darkness and uncertainty, grant us the eternal hope of the wise ones. When the terrors and the heartaches of this world threaten our faith, grant us the confidence and witness and shepherds in the night. When hope falls or fails us and doubt constrains us, let us remember the redeeming love that comes down on Christmas and lasts for all. Christ, we pray. Amen. You, you may open up your communion packages and get ready, and I will guide you through that. Let me remind all of us that this is a table of grace. As I mentioned earlier, we come as, as broken people, knowing that we are not where we need to be. And we come knowing that grace awaits us. Every time we turn, God is there with grace. So remember that. No matter how you feel about yourselves, what people say about you, what you think people think about you, it doesn't matter. As the lit lit liturgy said, what matters is God calls us beloved children. And that's the message we hear at Christmas. That's what we hear in our hearts, even when we are discouraged, disappointed, Maybe even at ourselves. The voice we hear is the voice of love from God that is shown to us in Jesus Christ. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body broken for you. Take this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took a cup and he poured it out. said, this is the new covenant that is found in the shedding of my blood. Take this and share it among yourselves. As often as you eat this bread... When you drink from this cup, you show forth my saving death until I come again. Let us pray. Wonderful God, we come before you, bowing our hearts and our lives, knowing that you are the one, the only one, who has grace. Grace for each one of us. Thank you that you know us by name. You know the struggles we face. You know our anxieties and our fears. And you... Call us by name and tell us to rest. Rest in your grace and love. And so, Lord, we come to this table and we're reminded once again of your love, your sacrifice, and your presence with us each and every day. In Christ we pray. Amen. My friends, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Take this to remember that Christ loves you. This is the symbol of his love, the new covenant shared in Christ's blood. Take this and share it among yourselves. Yeah.
that they would hear the message of your love and the comfort of your presence. We pray for those that are grieving loss, that you will walk with them, giving them courage. We pray for those that are living with anxiety and depression, that you will give them hope and help. We feel and pray for those that are feeling that they're a dead end, now, even those that are considering suicide. And we pray, Father, that you would save them through resources and people and kindness. Gracious God, we pray for this terrible situation in Oxford. We pray for the families that lost loved ones. Pray for a grieving and, and uh, anxious school. We pray that you will bring comfort and peace to them. We pray for this young man and his family who did the shooting and they will, they will get the help they need. Lord, we pray for, for Becky who's having heart surgery this next week. We pray for others that are going through rehab and, and uh, medical procedures. We pray for our friend Candace, the pastor at First Gallatin, as she is now beginning a new life with Greg with their wedding yesterday. We pray that you will bless them together as they begin life together. Gracious God, we pray that you will prepare us to celebrate the greatest gift in the world, Jesus Christ. May we pay attention to the things we do spiritually that prepare our hearts and our lives to celebrate, to see, and to hear this wonderful message. We offer this prayer and all of our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught all his children to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn is 198.